This is the Unit 5 AP Microeconomics Review. So in this review, we're going to go beyond the product market that we've been focusing on for this entire semester and look at the resource market, which if you remember in the circular flow, they all go around. It's just the product market was one side and the resource market was the other. And in the resource market, it changes the perspective a little bit. Because before, up until this point, we've looked at firms selling products to households. Now we're going to look at firms buying resources from households and households selling their resources to firms. The most notable example we're going to look at is labor. So when you go to work, you are selling your labor to the firm and in return, expect wages from the firm. So that's going to set up the concepts we're looking at in this unit. Before I get into the math and the graphs, I really wanted to go over some really important key definitions. And the first definition is derived demand. So derived demand looks at how the relationship between the product of a good affects the resources for that good. It's kind of like it sounds that the price changes and changes of a product will then directly influence the demand for the resource that is used to make that product. So it's looking at that connection of how product changes can affect resource changes, which is the theme of this unit. So that term and examples of that will come up a lot in this test. And we see, I have an example for you, the rise in demand for mobile phones and other mobile devices has led to a strong rise in demand for lithium, which is a resource used to make batteries in the phones. So it shows how the change in the product ends up affecting the change for the demand for the resource. The next term I want to go over is marginal product of labor. Now you see here I have a lot of abbreviations listed and there are a lot of abbreviations that are new and different and need to be known for this test. We're going to go through this. The marginal product of labor is a definition that looks at how much each additional unit of labor is bringing in, how much each worker is contributing. This we looked at a long time ago when we looked at the graph called the production function. It looked at by adding workers, how much is each worker contributing? And it was a graph that the line increased but at a decreasing rate and began to plateau, which illustrated the really important term diminishing marginal product. And that is something we use in the product market as well, and it applies in the labor market. The idea is as we hire additional units of labor, the workers will each start to contribute a smaller and smaller amount. The next term is the marginal revenue product. This looks at how much revenue each additional worker brings in. So in that way, it is the change in total revenue over the change in resource quantity. And when I say resource quantity in this class, we're going to be looking almost entirely at labor as the resource. So with each additional worker, what is the change in total revenue? And we're going to use that as well to determine how many workers we should hire. And the final thing we look at when determining workers is the marginal resource cost, MRC for short. Now it's kind of confusing because MRP and MRC sound very, very similar, but the R's are different. It's revenue for marginal revenue product and resource for marginal resource cost. If you remember back when we were determining profit maximization in many of the units in this class, we looked at marginal cost and marginal benefit and when they equal each other, that determines the profit maximizing quantity. It's the same concept with marginal revenue product and marginal resource cost. Marginal revenue product is almost the same exact idea as marginal benefit. Because think of the firm, the amount each worker brings in is going to be the benefit of hiring that worker. And the marginal cost is the marginal resource cost. So those two terms are very similar to the marginal benefit equaling marginal cost when we looked at the product market. And with that, we are going to use those two ideas to determine how many workers should be hired. And I'm going to go into that more when we look at the labor market graph. Now, two important formulas in this unit. The least cost rule, which if you remember the utility maximization rule from unit two, they are extremely similar and the same premise. Utility maximization was looking at how much of a good should a consumer consume and how much of another good should that consumer consume. And you're comparing your utility over price to determine that. Now we're looking at how much resources a firm should hire. And the two types of resources we're going to be looking at is labor 
and capital. So this formula will help a firm decide how many workers and how much capital they should employ in their business. And the formula also almost looks exactly like the utility maximization formula. We have the marginal product of labor over that price of labor, and we want that to be equal to the marginal product of capital over the price of capital. So this is showing at that point where they're equal, they're giving equal benefit to the firm. And just like in marginal utility, we set that amount when they equaled each other also equal to income because that's what limited how much consumers could buy. In the labor market, we set the least cost rule equal to the output the firm is wanting to produce. And we'll see that in an example, but that way it's not only at this point where they equal each other, but also equal to the output the firm is trying to produce. And the final formula is the profit maximization formula, which is going to be similar to what we looked at before with marginal benefit equaling marginal cost, but a little bit more complicated. So it's going to be the marginal revenue product of labor over the price of labor. And we're going to set that equal to the marginal revenue product of capital over the price of capital. And we want those to equal one. So pretty much you're going to be looking at a chart and figuring out at what point is the marginal revenue product of labor equal to the price and at what point is the marginal revenue product of capital equal to the price of capital. And let's look at that in an example because explaining it can not really sink in all the time. Okay, so this is the homework problem that we did as an example the other day, but it's also an excellent way to analyze the least cost rule and profit maximization. So we're going to use it for review as well. We notice in the prompt, it says the price of labor is $1 and the price of a unit of capital is $2. And the price of the good that is sold is 25 cents. Now why that's important is if it didn't have it already calculated out, the MRP of labor, you would need that price to calculate it out. So if I wanted to calculate, for example, the MRPL of one unit of labor, I would times the marginal product of 20 by the price of 25 cents. And that's where I got the five as my marginal revenue product of labor. So, if you have to calculate it out, you still need to know how to do that. But luckily, this chart is already filled out, so we don't have to do all the math right away. Now with this, we're going to start off with our least cost rule we spoke about a moment ago. The marginal product of labor over price of labor needs to equal the marginal product of capital over the price of capital. And what we need to do to achieve this is divide the marginal product of labor over the price and the marginal product of capital over the price. But luckily, since the marginal product of labor is only $1, these numbers would stay the same because 20 divided by one is 20. So I don't have to change this column. However, I do need to change my marginal product of capital because the price of capital is $2. So really quickly, I'm gonna divide each of these by the price to really set up the least cost rule so I can analyze it. So 20 divided by two is 10, then nine, then eight, then six, four, three, two. Now I'm going to follow the least cost rule. I need to find the points where the marginal product of labor over price equals the marginal product of capital over price. And there are several places where this happens. The key of knowing which one to choose is when it also equals an output of 120 units. So it has to meet all of those qualifications to really match the least cost rule. So we notice the first scenario where they equal each other is at 10 and 10. However, at 10, at four units of labor, 58 is made, and at one unit of capital, where it's also 10, 20 units are made. That doesn't add up to equal 120, so that can't be the combination we're looking for. So on the next one, they equal each other, is at five units of labor and at three units of capital, which then we have 66 plus 54. That does equal 120 units, and it follows the least cost rule. So that is going to be the least cost combination I'm looking for in this scenario. So five units of labor and three units of capital. So it meets both the formula and it equals the output the firm is looking to produce. 
Now we're going to do profit maximization, and I've included the formula for that as well, which remember the trick of that is finding the place where the MRPL equals to the price of labor and where the MRPC equals to the price of capital because you want them both to equal one. So it's not hard once you understand how the formula works. So at the point where PL equals one and MRPL equals one, it would be at six units of labor and the point where the price of capital is two and the MRPC is two would be at five units of capital. So that would be my profit maximizing combination. So that's how you do the formulas in a practical situation. The next thing I want to go over is the graph that goes with the labor market. And the most common graph you'll see is the graph in perfect competition in the labor market. In perfect competition in the product market, we had two side-by-side -side graphs, one for the market and one for the firm. Perfect competition in the labor market does the same thing. And for the same reasons, perfect competition in the product market looked at how firms and consumers were price takers of a product. In the labor market, there are so many workers, there's so many options that firms and workers are wage takers than the market graph in a product market where it was the supply of the product the producers are trying to sell and the demand for the product the consumers want to buy. Now we're looking at the supply and demand of labor, which as I said at the beginning, the households are the sellers of labor. So now the households are the supply line. It's dealing with the amount of labor available, the supply of workers, which comes from the households versus the de demand line is now the demand for labor line, which is more from the firm's perspective. This is how much labor the firm needs to hire. So it's a different type of supply and demand because it's dealing with resources instead of products. And the equilibrium would be the equilibrium wage. And as I said, since we are wage takers in perfect competition, that'll end up equaling the marginal resource cost for the firm. The wage is what they have to pay their workers. But we still have a downward sloping demand line. And also this demand line for the firm will end up equaling the marginal revenue product, which will be significant in a, for a firm deciding how much labor it should hire. Now we see here, I've already marked it, that the firm should hire up to this point right here where the two lines intersect. The reason why, if this line equals the marginal revenue product, it shows also how much each worker brings in. What we want is for the marginal revenue product to equal the marginal resource costs that we have right here. Just like, again, as I said earlier, where marginal benefit equals marginal cost in a product market graph to determine the profit maximizing quantity. So now I'm gonna find the point where they equal each other, which is where the two lines intersect. And the reason why if a firm technically could hire any quantity they wanted along this line. If they hired a worker up here and that worker's MRP was $10, they were bringing in $10, but the equilibrium wage is $5, that means this worker, this one worker, is bringing in more in revenue than they cost to be there. So the benefits are greater than the cost at this point. And as we've learned before, if benefits are greater than the cost, the firm is going to keep hiring workers. So they're gonna go down and down to the point where the MRP equals the MRC. So the wage the worker is being paid is equal to the revenue the worker is bringing in. Because after that point, if they went down here and this worker, five workers, let's say, We'll say that's three at equilibrium. If five workers were only bringing in three dollars in revenue a piece, then we see the firm is receiving less than they're paying their workers, which means their costs are greater than their benefit, and they don't want to hire at that point. So they're going to hire at the point of five dollars because that is the point where the cost of the worker, aka the wage, is equal to the amount the worker is bringing in.
And what we're going to see is things in the product market end up affecting the supply and demand for the resource market. And there are several things that affect the demand for labor. The three things that cause changes in the demand for labor are increases in demand, which you may also see as increases in product price in the product market which makes sense. If there's an increase in the demand for a product and equilibrium price goes up, there's also going to be an increase in demand for the labor to make, to, to make that product. The second reason is changes in productivity, where the more productive a worker is, the better quality labor they're providing. And the third is changes in the price of other resources, so like substitute resources and complementary resources. These three things will cause the demand for labor to increase. Now the supply of labor is a little different because again this is from the workers perspective, their willingness to give up their time to work. So things that affect the supply of labor are workers entering and exiting the industry, in terms of are they willing to work at that job at that wage or they're more or less immigration could be an example of more workers entering into the industry. And the second reason for the supply to change is changes in attitudes about work. Are people willing to work in that industry at that wage? The last thing we're going to talk about isn't asked about as much on the AP exam, but you do need to know that just like in the product market, the labor market has imperfect competition as well, where it's not perfect wage takers like we saw a moment ago. And the format we're going to look at for this is the monopsony market where it's kind of like a monopoly, but the inverse. A monopoly in the product market was one firm and many consumers. In the labor market, it's one firm hiring workers and many workers available. So because of this, that one firm will be a wage maker. They will get to decide how much they pay their workers versus in perfect competition when they were wage takers. And so because of this, it's not, the supply line is not perfectly elastic. And like how in a monopoly demand ended up separating from marginal revenue, in a monopsony, the supply ends up separating from marginal resource costs because as I hire more workers at a higher wage, I have to pay all my previous workers that higher wage as well. So what you're going to have to most likely do with this is look at how in an imperfectly competitive market, firms end up hiring less workers and paying them a lower wage. So it's not ideal, it's not socially optimal like perfect competition. So in perfect competition, a firm would hire at this point where supply equals demand. However, now that marginal resource cost has separated from the supply, in a monopsony market, the firm will hire at this quantity right here, a lower quantity than perfect competition. And also, because they're wage makers, the monopsony will end up paying their workers this low wage compared to in perfect competition when they paid them the wage right there. So this graph illustrates that when there's only one firm hiring labor, the workers end up getting hired less and paid less, illustrating it's an imperfect labor market. And that concludes the Unit 5 AP Microeconomics Review.